Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Four and a half years ago, we celebrated with the Knapp family at the investiture of the William and Jane Knapp Chair of Pharmacological Sciences. Little did we know at the time that it would inspire so much more. Today is a great honor to be gathered once again with the extended Knapp family to thank them for their generosity as we invest Dr. Margaret McGovern as the Knapp Chair in Pediatrics, Dr. Christopher Muratori as the Knapp Sweezy Chair in Pediatric Surgery, and Dr. Esther Takeuchi as the William and Jane Knapp Chair in Energy and the Environment. As it reads in our commemorative program, endowed professorships and chairs are the hallmark of a great university. From the start of my tenure here, it has been my goal to create 100 endowed faculty positions across a wide range of disciplines to help Stony Brook compete with our aspirational peers for the best and brightest faculty. I am most grateful that through the generosity of the Knapp family and others, we are just about halfway there. Bill, Jane, David, Michelle, Danielle, and Jesse, thank you so much for your partnership in helping Stony Brook reach this milestone. While I know Priscilla could not be here, I hope you will share with her how humbled and awed I am by your strategic investments that help build the excellence at our children's hospital, in pediatric surgery, and in energy storage research. With apologies to Margaret Mead, never doubt that a caring family of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ken Koshansky, Senior Vice President of Health Sciences and Dean of our School of Medicine, who will introduce the NAP Chair in Pediatrics. Thank you, Sam. It's my distinct pleasure today to introduce one of our major leaders and a driving force for Stony Brook Medicine's rising trajectory and momentum in academic medicine. Dr. Peggy McGovern is a leader who plays many roles at Stony Brook Medicine. She is physician in chief of Stony Brook Children's Hospital. She is chair of the Department of Pediatrics. She serves as associate dean for ambulatory operations and is a distinguished physician scientist receiving international recognition for her expertise in Neiman Pick disease a rare metabolic disorder of children. That is a lot of balls in the air. And she carries them with aplomb. Since her arrival in 2007, Peggy has elevated the stature of Stony Brook Children's Hospital, now serving as the regional and a national leader in children's medicine. In fact, you cannot think of Dr. McGovern and not think about Stony Brook Children's Hospital. In 2009, under her guidance, a new pediatric emergency department opened its doors, devoted entirely to the care of children, and the following year came the official formation of Stony Brook Children's Hospital, the month that I arrived at Stony Brook. I remember thinking, what a wonderful welcoming gift. Working together with a wide range of faculty members, administrators, and outside entities, Peggy has forged a number of new programs here, including the Celiac Disease and Gluten Sensitivity Center, the only such facility on Long Island, the Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy Center, the only such facility in the entire tri-state area, and the nation's first pediatric multiple sclerosis center, and the aforementioned very busy pediatric emergency department that now provides around-the-clock expert care for children all across Long Island. Stony Brook Children's is the Suffolk County's only level four regional perinatal center and includes a pediatric hematology oncology program, a pediatric cardiology program, a pediatric HIV and AIDS center, and a cystic fibrosis center. One might ask why? Why offer all these services? The answer is simple. Stony Brook Children's is the only children's hospital and academic center serving 400,000 children who reside in Suffolk County. But if anything, Stony Brook is about our people, 
both within the university and our extended family, hugely epitomized by the Knapps and Sweezies. That is what we are celebrating today. As chair of the Department of Pediatrics, Peggy has overseen tremendous growth in our faculty and staff to now encompass 180 specialists in more than 30 pediatric specialties and subspecialties. Peggy earned her medical and doctoral degrees at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine, where she was elected Alpha Omega Alpha Honorary Society, followed by residency and fellowship training at Mount Sinai Hospital. Perhaps best of all, she is a native Long Islander and a distinguished alumna of Stony Brook University. In that regard, she serves as a personal testament of our university's exceptional leadership and a true champion for developing the best ideas in medicine. And that defines the essence of why it is my honor to recognize her as the inaugural Knapp Endowed Chair in Pediatrics. And now I'd like to welcome Dr. Stanley back to the podium. Dr. McGovern, could you join us at the podium? It is my distinct privilege to confer upon you the title of the Knapp Chair in Pediatrics and present you with this certificate, which reads, Stony Brook University proudly recognizes your outstanding contributions in teaching and research, honors your exemplary contribution to the field of pediatrics, and acknowledges the distinction you bring to the university as the inaugural Knapp Chair in Pediatrics. Established in 2010 through the generosity of the Knapp Sweezy Foundation, Island Outreach Foundation, and the Gardner Foundation, this chair enables the university to recognize a world-class scholar and educator in the School of Medicine. Presented at a ceremony of investiture, November 14th, 2017. Thank you, Dr. Kashansky, for those very kind words and for the trust that you, Dr. Stanley, and the leadership at Stony Brook University have placed in me to lead our children's health program. I want to join you in extending my thanks to the Knapp family for their extraordinary generosity and support of Stony Brook Children's Hospital, for endowing the Knapp Chair in Pediatrics, and honoring me with being its first occupant. Thank you. Over the past few years, I've had the opportunity to meet with the members of the Knapp family and the boards of their foundations. You are truly a thoughtful, kind, and generous family, and I hope that each of you know what your support means to the community we serve and how important the legacy of the endowed chairs you've established is to the growth of the clinical, research, and education missions of Stony Brook Children's. I also want to thank my husband, John, who was here, who I met 41 years ago when I was an undergraduate student right here at Stony Brook University, and to whom I've now been married for 38 years. He was right there by my side through the MD and PhD studies at Mount Sinai and the many years of clinical training. When I was in the hospital on call every third night during my internship year, he was on call at home caring for our infant son, Anthony, who's grown up, and there he is. I don't know who had the more difficult job. Uh, but two demanding careers and three children later, we're still making it work. Of course, we had lots of help along the way. My parents, Sarah and Joseph Jacobina, who are here to celebrate this evening with us, were big contributors to our balancing act. I hope they won't be angry at me for telling you that they are 90 and 91 years old. And if you get a chance to chat with them after at the reception, you will find that they are as sharp as they ever were, which bodes well for my continued <laughs> cognitive abilities. <laughs> you know, neither of my parents went to college, but they provided an environment that fueled my passion for learning. Every Monday night, trips to the library with my dad throughout my childhood so I could get my armful of books for the week, the many sacrifices they made to educate us, 
and the constant encouragement they provided as my education and training seemed to go on and on and on. When we started our family, they jumped right in to help care for our children, allowing me to have some semblance of work-life balance. Thank you, Mom and Dad, you are the best. I've also been blessed with outstanding mentorship, beginning in college when by complete serendipity, I wound up working in Jorge Benache's lab, which is one of the first occupants of the then still under construction Health Sciences Center. Under his guidance, I learned how to work as part of a research team, mastered the art of collecting ticks in the field and identifying mosquitoes in the laboratory, and garnered my first peer-reviewed publication. But more importantly, I gained a friend and trusted advisor. Thank you, Jorge and Barbara, for your decades of valued friendship. I don't usually wear hats. Now, <laughs> it becomes dangerous in speeches like this to start to single out people to thank, but I really have to acknowledge two others who have been so important to me since my return to Stony Brook 10 years ago. My assistant, Pam Siebel, who is my right hand, confidant, and sounding board, and my administrator, Seema Bajaj. Together, we are a great team, and we always figure out how to get to yes for whatever it is we need to do to move our program forward. I am so grateful for all you do to help me. So I've taken away many important lessons in my lifetime that I believe have served me well in the various roles that I've had the privilege of filling, and I would like to tell you about three of them very briefly today. The first is the importance of being able to tell one story. My career as an investigator began when I was six years old and entered the science fair at my school. My project, a terrarium, won first prize, not for its scientific sophistication. It was, after all, just a glass bowl with some dirt in it, a plant, and a piece of saran wrap affixed to its opening with a rubber band. No, I won because I was able to communicate how that simple system worked to support the growth of a living plant. I've carried that lesson with me since that day. Being able to tell your story, whether it's how a terrarium works, what your research idea is, what treatment you have to offer when a family entrusts their sick child to your care, or why a university should get behind the idea of a children's hospital among all the competing priorities of a complex organization, telling the story matters. Well, the Naps know this because they've heard that story maybe more times than they would have cared to. Um, and the details of my story have, of course, changed through the years, but my narrative has always been a quest, seeking treasure, like uncovering new knowledge through research, seeing hope on a mother's face when her child with a fatal disorder qualifies for your clinical trial, hearing the whoops of joy at the other end of the phone when you call a faculty member to tell them their promotion came through, or getting your resident match list in March and seeing that the entering PGY1 class is what you hoped it would be. Lesson number two took a little bit longer for me to learn, and that is don't be afraid to challenge the dogma. When you earn a doctoral degree, there's a final step, the thesis defense, where your advisory committee members grill you for hours about your research project, its findings, and how you interpreted them. Suffice it to say, despite my ability to tell a great story, it was a stressful day. At my thesis defense, Kurt Hirshhorn, a world-famous geneticist who was the chair of my committee, asked me to speculate on how the phenotype of inherited disorder could be influenced by the sex of the parent who passed on the defective gene to their child. Well, this was in the 1980s, well before we understood the mechanism of a phenomenon called genomic imprinting, which causes genes to be expressed in a parent of origin specific manner. So of course, no one knew the mechanism at that point, including me, and furthermore, unlike Kurt, I had never even thought about it. However, I muddled through a reasonable enough response to pass my exam and was awarded my doctoral degree. But I took away from that exchange that nothing, not even the central dogma of molecular biology or the principles of Mendelian genetics should be taken at face value. As I've progressed in my career, I have found that challenging assumptions not only must be in the DNA of a scientist, but also has served me well in growing education and clinical programs and figuring out how to navigate the business of medicine. At the same time that I had this revelation about challenging well-accepted doctrine, I was learning lesson number three that there is always a place for tradition. 
In academic medicine, the tradition is to support a threefold mission. Preparation of the next generation of physicians, creation of new scientific knowledge, and provision of excellent clinical service to patients. That is not to say our traditions have not been challenged and molded by social, political, economic, and scientific forces. They have been, and change is both inevitable and necessary. But there is always a place for honoring the legacy of gifted clinicians and investigators, forging collaborations between clinical and basic scientists to make medical advances, and seeing one, doing one, teaching one, which has contributed to the education of generations of residents. So my story also is one that is steeped in tradition, symbolized today here by the academic regalia we all wear. For me, the most important tradition is one pediatricians have held dear for years, well before family and patient-centered care became a popularized buzz phrase, as if we needed to be reminded of what we knew all along, that patients and their families must be the center of every decision, every action, and every plan. Today marks the beginning of a new tradition for Stony Brook Children's, the first in a line of investitures of committed leaders who will occupy the NAP chair in pediatrics for far into the future, who will speak with passion and act with conviction to improve children's health and serve as role models for the next generation of pediatricians. So let me end by saying to the NAPs, what an important tradition you have started here today. I am honored to be part of it and I thank you. Thank you, Peggy. <clears throat> and now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Christopher Murituri, the inaugural Knapp Sweezy Endowed Chair in Pediatric Surgery. Chris is new to Stony Brook Children's Hospital, but he's a long-standing national leader in pediatric surgery research and education. Chris joined Stony Brook in September from Brown University, where he had been Associate Professor of Surgery and Pediatrics since 2013. At Brown, Chris was an attending physician at two major hospitals in Providence, Hasbro Children's Hospital, a division of the Rhode Island Hospital, the major teaching hospital of Brown's Medical School, and the Women's and Infants Hospital of Rhode Island. A dedicated educator, Chris served as the director of Brown's Pediatric Surgery Residency Program. Chris also served as medical director of the Rhode Island Hospital's ECMO program, or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, the only such life-saving support program in the region. At Hasbro's Children's Hospital, he served as surgical director of the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit and as co-director of the Multidisciplinary Vascular Anomalies Clinic, treating both pediatric and adult patients. Chris has special expertise in fetal surgery for patients with severe congenital diaphragmatic hernia, fetal management of twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome, treatment of complex vascular and lymphatic malformations, and ECMO. As a research scientist, Chris continues to do work to advance ECMO, in particular the safety of the required anticoagulation or blood thinning as perhaps the only hematologist in the room, I can certainly appreciate blood coagulation. He was also a key investigator on the FDA-sponsored investigational device exemption for in utero tracheal occlusion for severe congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Another area of translational investigation by Chris and his colleagues is the liver and understanding its intrinsic capacity to repair itself and recover from inflammatory insults such as those associated with neonatal gastrointestinal complications. An active scholar and clinician, Chris is the author of numerous peer-reviewed articles as well as book chapters. He serves as a reviewer of several major journals, including the Journal of Surgical Research, the Journal of Pediatric Surgery, and Pediatrics. He's an associate editor of the second edition of Fundamentals of Pediatric Surgery, which was published earlier this year. Chris received his medical degree from Georgetown University. He completed his general surgery residency training at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston and his pediatric surgery residency at Boston Children's Hospital. 
During his general surgery training, Chris spent an additional year of study at Children's Hospital of Boston as the ICU and ECMO fellow, followed by two additional years of training in the Pediatric Surgical Research Laboratories investigating the treatment of congenital diaphragmatic hernia. With such an outstanding resume, it is my distinct pleasure to recognize Dr. Christopher Murtori as the inaugural Knapp Sweezy Endowed Chair in Pediatric Surgery. And now, please. And now I'd like to invite President Stanley back to the podium. Dr. Muratori, could you join us at the podium? It is my distinct pleasure to confer upon you the title of the Knapp Sweezy Chair in Pediatric Surgery and present you with this certificate, which reads, Stony Brook University proudly recognizes your outstanding contributions in teaching and research, honors your exemplary service to the field of pediatric surgery, and acknowledges the distinction you bring to the university as the inaugural Knapp Sweezy Chair in Pediatric Surgery. Established in 2017 through the generosity of the Knapp Sweezy Foundation, this chair enables the university to recognize a world-class scholar and educator in the School of Medicine. Presented at a ceremony of investiture, November 14, 2017. Thank you. Thank you all very much. <clears throat> President Stanley, Dean Kashansky, <clears throat> the Knapp family, Dr. McGovern, and Dr. Yushi. Uh, honored guests and friends, uh, a few acknowledgments first. Um, I'm really touched, overwhelmed. <clears throat> I want to, from the very start, as uh, was already stated, uh, acknowledge the incredible effort and, and singular focus of Dr. Peggy McGovern um, and, the, and her team. <clears throat> to really push forward and build the new children's hospital. And the Knapp family and the many, many donors, local business, industry contributors who make this a reality today. I really want to thank you. <clears throat> In similar fashion, though, I'd like to recognize the uh, historical perspective of pediatric surgery on Long Island, and we would be remiss if we did not recognize Dr. Preeby, uh, likewise, who literally this has to be a dream come true for you. And I want to thank Dr. Talamini, my partners, and the surgical team for a, a very, very warm welcome for a very short time that we've been here. Um, but I, I especially w would really like to recognize the incredible effort, dedication, and commitment of uh, Dr. Rich Scriven, who I believe is right there. Rich. Rich, uh, who deserves so much of the credit for single-handedly keeping the surgical service alive and well, uh, and well prepared for the next evolution. So, Rich, thank you. I would like to thank my wife, Amy, my children, Isabella, Paul, and Dominic, for their continued support, their love and patience through this transition, moving from Rhode Island to New York. I know it's not been easy, but certainly a, uh, off to a great start, guys. So thank you. So I, I am truly humbled and honored uh, to be named the inaugural Knapp Sweezy Professor in Pediatric Surgery at Stony Brook University and Stony Brook Children's Hospital. Uh, it's really a, a very surreal that a kid from Valley Stream uh, would return to New York uh, for such a prestigious opportunity and join such a talented leadership team to grow, oversee, and specifically advocate for children's surgical services. So I am I'm thrilled. I would joke to so many people, residents, trainees over the years that you know, the life of a pediatric surgeon can be pretty lonely, I mean, let's face it. Um, when you make the decision to go into pediatric surgery, You've, you've got to go through years of general surgery training, and that's after medical school and everything else, of course. And so you make the announcement 
to your chair of surgery, who was never a chair of pediatric surgery. They're a big chair of general surgery, where surgeons become general surgeons and academic surgeons and researchers. And you make that announcement, and then everybody else finds out that you want to become a pediatric surgeon, and they lament, why in the world would you want to become a pediatric surgeon? Why do you want to deal with those parents and the complaints and the whining and the crying? No, 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 you don't understand. It really is the last bastion of, of general surgery. It's the best place in the world. It's, I'm so inspired. That, fine, 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 go ahead. <laughs> then you march on over the bridge, and you go to the children's hospital, and you walk over there very confidently, thinking you got the support of everybody, and you're looking for your pediatric colleagues, and you see them, and then they see you, and they run the other way. Because they're like, what's the surgeon doing over here? Don't let the surgeon, why the surgeon's here? Let's you know, go run in a different direction. Completely opposite culture. Absolutely very incongruent. The best reaction of all, though, happens from the nurse. You walk into the ICU, the NICU, and you get accosted by the nurses who basically say, don't wake the baby. So the, the truth is, however, um, there really is no better patient advocate uh, than the parent of uh, a sick child or that child's nurse. And the involvement of both is, is so critical to the success of any children's hospital and, and or any of its many specific programs of distinction, be it trauma, trauma surgery, oncology, child life, or, or rehabilitation. And, and moreover, nowhere is there more reliance on the surrounding communities, uh, both local and afar, uh, than with the support and philanthropy for children's hospitals and their missions. And children's hospitals demand and require philanthropy. Children do not have jobs. Insurance about as minimal as possible. And we rely so heavily on our surrounding structure and certainly philanthropy. So it's up to us to promote the programmatic development that improves children's health needs in the region and garner that talent and keep them here. As pediatric surgeons, I, we, we play in many other people's sandboxes. <laughs> uh, and this is especially true in a hospital setting such as ours, when the children's hospital is part of a larger academic medical campus. And there can be some disadvantages to that scenario. Pediatrics is often forgotten, we often if you're in pediatrics or pediatric surgical services, you're often concerned that you are at the bottom of the barrel. Uh, but there are some really distinct advantages of this arrangement. And coming from a similar background at Brown most recently, I really believe in my heart of hearts that it is a truly huge advantage. And I think the trick here, and with the right team that I've joined, is really to harness the talent and the clinical talent expertise of its academic medical center and the medical school and to enhance the children's surgical services. And I believe that's exactly what we're poised to do. It's already been happening and now the rest of the world will see this. So for example, if you take minimally invasive surgery and robotics, there's no reason in the world why this can't be exploited for children and Stony Brook and the center of Long Island would be exactly um, the location for children's uh, minimally invasive advancements. You can take a world-class adult cardiac medical and surgical service, a New York State recognized ventricular assist device program for heart failure, a VAD program. You can extend this infrastructure for the necessary ECMO or extracorporeal uh, membrane oxygenation that Dean mentioned. You can extend this service and it should be extended for neonates, newborns who have respiratory failure and cardiac issues. This can be extended for children. This, this is the location where this program can grow and Stony Brook, again, can become the destination center for three million New Yorkers who would require extracorporeal life support. In another example, there are currently uh, more adult survivors of congenital heart disease than there are children born with congenital heart disease per year. This example, in my mind, demonstrates the unique qualifications and the emphasis that children's hospitals and its providers play in the transition of childhood and adolescent diseases into adulthood. These children, now young adults, are often lost in transition. Nowhere is this more evident today than in the continuing success of pediatric um, oncology survivors who really require lifelong evaluation and management of the possible late effects of cancer treatments that they received as kids, be it surgical, radiation, or chemotherapy. 
On the other hand, more and more young adults with specific cancers are being treated by pediatric oncologists in the pediatric setting on children's oncology protocols because they are much more aggressive and have much higher outcomes and better success rates than a lot of the standard adult protocols. So what I've just described is a system of transitional care and translational care between adolescence and adulthood. Relatively newer, evolving field that is desperately, where desperately needed medical and surgical care for survivors of childhood conditions exist. A deliberate intention to provide seamless health care from infancy through adolescence to adulthood, to steal a line from another institution, not just health care, but the delivery of health with care. Care about education, care about your community, care about wellness, curbing obesity, gun violence, and the disparities that exist between children and adolescents and adults or in your community. Stony Brook and Stony Brook Children certainly is poised to be a leader in this fashion. In the U.S., there are about 35 freestanding independent children's hospitals, 35. There are about 200 other children's hospitals that are part of a bigger general hospital, much like Stony Brook Children's. However, there are over 5,000 hospitals that focus on adult care by itself. I mean, the numbers are striking. There are about 75 to 80 million children or people who are less than 18 years of age. And when you think of the math, it does not add up. This glaring inequality needs to be addressed if we want our children to receive the very best and the very best possible care, be it medical, surgical. And yet still in the United States, the vast majority of children's surgical care is being provided in non-children's hospitals by adult providers. This must change. And children deserve the optimal care provided in the optimal environment. And this is exactly what the Knapp Family and the Knapp Sweezy Foundation allows us to do. Parents, physicians, our local regional leaders, we need to be better educated about this growing issue. So finally, we need to make children's health care services and children's surgical services a national priority, and I believe it's happening, and I believe Stony Brook can contribute to that message. A children's hospital such as this, that's part of a larger system, really is the crown jewel of its academic medical center. The Knapp family and the Knapp Sweezy Foundation and all of your collective contributions will no doubt allow Stony Brook Children's Hospital to rise to that occasion and be that stimulus for change. Again, I'm, I'm truly honored and grateful uh, to be a part of this. Uh, I look forward to working with meeting as many of you as possible. Uh, I thank you again for your recognition. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Muratori. So as president of the university, I usually leave the recruitment of faculty in the able hands of our deans and department chairs and academic search committees. However, when I learned that Esther Takeuchi was interested in joining our College of Engineering and Applied Sciences and Brookhaven National Laboratory, which Stony Brook manages, I could not sit on the sidelines. I knew that her recruitment would be transformational to our aspiration of becoming a national leader in renewable energy research and energy storage. As the holder of over 150 US issued patents, more than any other American woman, she has won acclaim for her translational research as well as her basic research. Dr. Takeuchi received the National Medal of Technology and Innovation in 2009 from President Obama for her work developing the technology for the power source and cardiac defibrillators, the tiny batteries that made the implantable medical devices a life-saving reality. More recently, Dr. Takeuchi's lab at Stony Brook University was awarded a $10 million Department of Energy Frontier Grant for fundamental research into how batteries work germane to the full utilization of renewable energy sources, including wind, photovoltaic, hydroelectric, and geothermal power. In today's world, where sustainability is key, Dr. Takeuchi's research could not be more important. And I would be remiss if I did not add that her highly notable accomplishments also include a commitment to women in science and engineering. With women making up only 14% 
of practicing engineers, it is striking that nine of Dr. Takeuchi's 14 graduate students are women. Clearly, Dr. Takeuchi epitomizes the standard for the holder of an endowed chair. Esther, please join me at the podium. It is my distinct privilege to confer upon you the title of the William and Jane Knapp Chair in Energy and the Environment and present you with this certificate, which reads, Stony Brook University proudly recognizes your outstanding contributions in teaching and research, honors your exemplary service to the field of energy storage, science, and technology, and acknowledges the distinction you bring to the university as the inaugural William and Jane Knapp Chair in Energy and the Environment. Established in 2016 through the generosity of William and Jane Knapp, this chair enables the university to recognize a world-class scholar and educator in the departments of chemistry and materials sciences and chemical engineering, presented at a ceremony of investiture November 14, 2017. Good afternoon, everyone. I am so uh, grateful and so honored to be here today. It is uh, such a pleasure and delight. I'm forever grateful to President Stanley for his role in helping to bring me to Stony Brook University and the Knapp family, specifically uh, Bill and Jane, uh, provide us the opportunity uh, to begin to change the world and it really does start at Stony Brook. So what I wanted to do is just take a few moments to talk about impact and the kinds of things that we're thinking about and the enormous difference that having uh, chaired funding, which is more discretionary than uh, specific research funding and some of the things that it enables us to do and enables us to uh, think about. So I want to start with um, pointing out that educating the next generation of scientists is something that we take very seriously. It's going to be this generation that brings us into the future and addresses the, the problems that face us in the 21st century. We have enormously talented, hardworking, energetic graduate students and we've just recruited a, a new group um, this uh, incoming fall, and I'm so proud of all of them and the future that they hold. While I'm on this picture, I have to also comment that nobody makes a journey by themselves. The journey really is always accompanied and supported by the people that surround you. So for the current and past graduate students and postdocs that have been part of our group, I'm really grateful for the enthusiasm and hard work. My husband, Ken Takeuchi, who is a chemistry faculty member, um, has been an integral part of our research effort and a creative force behind many of the new materials that we look at. Uh, Amy Marshallock, who's been a research collaborator for 10 years, has been instrumental in so many of the initiatives that we bring forward uh, both in terms of inspiration and execution. And I've had so many wonderful colleagues over the years, both in academics and industry, that have enabled us to make uh, significant progress. So I want to talk a little bit about what we do. So in its basic sense, we use chemicals to store electricity and generate electricity. So we make batteries. And as President Stanley said, one of the things that we're looking at as part of our Department of Energy funding is understanding why batteries get hot and can we make them get less hot and generate more electricity. It's a very fundamental work. We've worked on batteries to extend the lifetime of medical devices and cardiac defibrillators. Uh, currently, we have a program where we're working on batteries for automotive applications, actually several programs on automotive applications to make them safe, make them last longer. 
Uh, we've worked on batteries for outer space, uh, both in terms of satellites for very, very lightweight batteries and batteries that power things like hand warmers for, uh, for astronauts that are very safe. But as I mentioned, when you write a proposal, the granting agencies expect you to deliver against what you wrote. And so if you're interested in a new area or think you can take on a different challenge, um, it's difficult sometimes within the confines of, of all of these proposals. So what we're thinking about now is truly a grand challenge. There's a report that came out from the National Academy of Engineering that spelled out the greatest engineering achievements of the 20th century. And they identified a list of them, but the very top of the list was electrification providing electricity to the vast majority of the inhabitants of the United States has been recognized as the greatest achievement. But these days, in the 21st century, the dynamics are changing. What we're thinking about now is what's going to be the source of that electricity moving forward? Are we going to continue to burn fossil fuel, which is what we do today? Or are there other alternatives? And so when we think about things like wind power or solar power, the challenge is that they're not smooth and they're not on all of the time. So obviously the sun shines during the day and it doesn't shine at night. So how do we translate um, that ability into something that's useful? and can make the world um, a cleaner, greener place? And the answer is storage. If we can store the electricity that's generated by renewable power, smooth it out, and then use it when we need it, then we can enable things like addition of wind and solar to the grid. It's very fascinating. The, the grid and power in Long Island is so important because we get hurricanes, so it becomes all apparent how, how critical it is. And the way the grid works is they're making power and somebody's using it. If somebody stops using it, there's actually no place to put it. So fascinating the way the grid works. So what would that do if we could create large-scale storage that could really couple with um, the grid and also establish what are called microgrids? So these would be small, maybe neighborhood, maybe apartment building, uh, maybe urban areas where you would have local generation by probably solar, but maybe wind, and you could store the power. So I just show a, an example of what Long Island looked like before and after a blackout. So you see Long Island on the left all lit up, and on the right, it's essentially dark. So if you have local generation and local storage, then each area can function on its own and be resilient in times when the broader grid uh, becomes uh, unavailable. Also, there are areas in the world that simply don't and likely will not have access to a power grid. And I use two examples from Stony Brook University. One is areas of Madagascar and the Turkana Basin Institute in Africa. Just a couple weeks ago, I met with Richard Leakey. And his frustration is real. They have this wonderful education center. They're looking at building truly a world-class um, museum. But the question is how to power it. He points out, during the day, we have all the sun we need. And then what happens at night? And so we talked about possible storage solutions. And I can tell you that today on the market, the types of solutions that they need simply don't exist. So that's where we really believe we can contribute and begin to contemplate systems that can be used in microgrids and uh, provide resiliency and uh, long-term um, reliability. 
And my last example is something that we're witnessing today. So these are uh, pictures of uh, Puerto Rico before and after the hurricane. And so the challenge is that if the grid is all connected and you have to reestablish everything all at once, then it's a kind of a slow slogging process. And it, you know, weeks and months have gone by and the, the, the individuals there are still challenged by this problem. But if things become more distributed and more localized, then each you know, neighborhood, each town can kind of come back to life and come back to power kind of bit by bit while the whole thing is still being rebuilt. So coupling local power generation with large scale storage can certainly provide resiliency and this is an example um, that's in front of us right now. So I'd like to once again thank President Stanley for his truly visionary leadership of this wonderful university and how he's plotting a course into the future that raises the bar and makes Stony Brook among the, the greats. I would also be remiss if I didn't mention um, uh, Dr. Jim Savage. Jim Savage is the Associate Lab Director at Brookhaven, and I can tell you that without the efforts and commitment of both President Stanley and Dr. Savage, our research team would not be here today, and I'm so proud of the work that Stony Brook and Brookhaven can do jointly. There are very few examples of universities and national labs working as synchronously as ours do and it provides us the opportunity um, to begin, as I say, to change the world. But before I close, I'm so grateful and thankful for the visionary Knapp family, for their contributions to Stony Brook as a whole, um, to their contributions to our efforts. And I can tell you that we work very hard uh, to make the, the future vision and all of our dreams a, a reality. So congratulations also to my colleagues and uh, other recipients of the chairs today, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Esther. On July 1, 2011, we embarked on the campaign for Stony Brook University to raise $600 million by July 2018, the largest capital campaign in SUNY history. This was a lofty goal, make no mistake. And at the time, there were some skeptics out there. From the start, the Knapp family understood that we needed their confidence and encouragement to become one of the best public universities in the world. They believe and the noble mission of Stony Brook University and understand that it takes considerable financial resources from our friends and alumni to create the margin of excellence in teaching and research. Dave, Bill, Jane, Michelle, Danielle, Jerry, and Jesse, your leadership is felt every time a sick child arrives at our pediatric emergency room, every time a family entrusts their child in the hands of our surgeons, and with every female engineer leaving Stony Brook University, knowing that she will help solve the challenges of sustainability and renewable energy. And it is felt in countless other ways, reflecting your wide-ranging philanthropy, which has touched so many parts of our campus. Winston Churchill famously said, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. In your case, the Knapp family philanthropy is also directly saving lives and helping to create a better life for all of us into the future. How lucky we are, how lucky our extended community is to have you among us. On behalf of Stony Brook University, I thank you. <laughs> Bill and David, on behalf of the family, could you join me at the podium? It is my great privilege to present you and your family with these certificates, which read, with deep gratitude, 
Stony Brook University recognizes your extraordinary generosity and splendid support of excellence in teaching, research, and scholarship, reflected in your establishment of the Knapp Chair in Pediatrics, the Knapp Sweezy Chair in Pediatric Surgery, and the William and Jane Knapp Chair in Energy and in the Environment, presented at a ceremony of investiture November 14, 2017. I've been asked to make some comments about why giving is important and why we chose these specific areas. My mother, Priscilla Knapp, who couldn't be here tonight because she's under the weather, has taught us by example for many years the importance of supporting organizations that help improve the community. One of her passions is health care. She stoked that passion by serving on the board of Brookhaven Memorial Hospital and has jumped with, in with both feet to support the Children's Hospital at Stony Brook. She's thrilled to have partnered on the chair for Dr. McGovern and funded herself the chair for Dr. Morator. Dave and Michelle have also demonstrated a passion for health care in the region. Michelle is an active board member on the uh, Brookhaven Memorial Hospital, and David and Michelle both sit on Dr. Kashansky's advisory council. Prior to uh, their participation in Dr. McGovern's chair, they made a capital contribution to the construction of the Children's Hospital. Danielle and Jesse are active members of the boards of two of the foundations represented here today. Danielle's a working therapist and has worked with patients at both Stony Brook and Brookhaven Memorial Hospital. Jane and I are active Stony Brook alumni, class of 78. Jane is a past president of the Alumni Association and I sit on the Stony Brook Foundation Board. We've funded some scholarships through the Alumni Association and of another chair in the Department of Pharmacology currently held by Dr. Basil uh, Rigges. And Dr. Takeuchi is our first chair outside of the health sciences, although, as we heard, she has made quite some contribution to health sciences. We have family members who would not be alive today if it were not for the hospital at Stony Brook, in particular, the neonatal department. We have family members and near family members who work at the hospital. We give here so that the wider community can share the peace of mind that comes with having this tremendous facility here. I don't want to think about what this hospital and university would be like without philanthropic support. Thank you. So thank you so much, Bill, and, and thank you again to David, Michelle, Jane, Danielle, Jesse, Priscilla, who's not here today, and everyone who took time out to be with us on this very special evening. Uh, in the spirit of Thanksgiving, um, I hope you will join us in the lobby for refreshments uh, and the chance again to give thanks to the Knapp family for their extraordinary generosity. Thank you all so much. Thank you.